So just to relax the body some more, we're going to work through from the very top of the body. So bring your attention to the top of your head. Notice if there's tightness in the muscles of the scalp and the temples. And just observe that sensation of tightness. Gently breathing in and out and see if the muscles are able to slacken off at all. May or may not be able to do that. And take a few moments, you might find that as you breathe in and out, those muscles will slowly, gently relax. And then slowly moving your attention down the body. Be aware of tension in the muscles of your face. Just let your face settle into a very calm, relaxed expression. Let the muscles go loose. Notice any tension that's in the jaw. You can move your jaw around a little bit to loosen it up. So this is the area, the jaw and the neck the shoulders where we hold a lot of our attention. So we'll spend a bit of time here. Bring your awareness to the muscles of the neck. They want to very slowly just move your head from side to side to bring awareness to what's happening in those muscles. Gently allow them to ease off. Shoulders, notoriously, we have a lot of tension there most of the time. So we're carrying the stresses of the day in our bodies. So again, you can gently move the shoulders up and down, or back and forward, or rotate them slightly just to free up out of the body and let the tightness in the muscles loosen off. Slowly moving down the arms, upper arms and forearms palms of the hand and the fingers and the wrists. Again, just very slight, gentle movements to allow the muscles to move freely and relax. Coming back to the upper body, to the chest, the upper back. As you breathe in and out, see if your chest is moving freely as you breathe, or if it's constricted. And see if you can let go of any tense muscles in the chest and the upper back.
and notice the movement of your abdomen as you breathe. So it should be able to move in and out freely as you breathe in and out. And sometimes people can track the abdomen as they breathe in. And that's not the, um, the best, I think. So natural movement should be to move out as you breathe in and move in as you breathe out. See if it's following the breath, going with the breath, like a pair of bellows, gently moving to and fro without too much tightness in the abdominal muscles. I'm just spend a moment or two just following that movement. Continuing to relax any part of your body that is still tight. And then scanning through the pelvic area. Again, you might find that, you know, um, that back and forth movement kind of rocking in the pelvic bones might bring some freedom there. You can also move a little bit side to side. So that there's a sense of freedom other than being sort of locked up in that area. And then continue scanning down the legs, thighs and calves, letting go of any tense muscles you find, down into the feet. Spend a bit of time there, you may want to wiggle the toes. Just bring that relaxation right down into your feet. Feel the connection to the ground. That sense of having a solid base. Somehow some sense of, of safety groundedness and settle into that. And then slowly scanning back up the body again. Letting go of any remaining tension that you find. And as you come back into the head area, Bring your attention to rest at the entrance to the nose. And just follow the flow of air in and out. Rest your attention on the sensation of the air passing the entrance to the nostrils.
just follow that movement as you breathe all the way in the momentary pause and then breathing all the way out just breathing in a natural rhythm And just observe how your attention goes on and off that point. So the intention is to keep the, att the attention right on that sensation of air passing that point where it comes in to the nostrils. And usually after a short time, the mind will decide to wander off somewhere else. So that's completely normal. Just notice that it's happened. Right? That was a thought. And when you realize that your attention has left the object of meditation. Then just let go of the thought, don't need to pursue it right now. There will be no disastrous consequences of not following that thought. But just gently bring your attention back to following the breath. So we'll do that for a couple of minutes. Each time the attention wanders away, just notice that's happened and gently bring it back again.
sometimes you might find that the mind has gone off into quite a, a long monologue. <clears throat> and uh, you know, this can kind of give rise to a bit of discouragement, I'm not doing very well. But once again, it's just completely normal. So the response is just simply to notice that is what has happened. No judgment, good or bad, that's what's happened. And now we come back to the breath. You might find it helpful to keep your attention there, to count the breaths. Um, people have different ways of doing it. Um, um, I'm going to suggest the way that I do it, because it's easier for me to teach the way that I do it, um, which is to count one for each full breath in and out, count up to seven breaths and then start again. So we're going to try to do three rounds of seven breaths and then we're going to finish after that. Okay, so this is quite um, useful then because you may be able to just see kind of how much of a round of seven breaths, you're able to be with the breath and how much of that time the mind is wandering off. Okay, so we're gonna try that three sets of seven breaths. It will take about three or four minutes. Okay. You may not finish at the same time as me, but don't worry about that. So just counting all the way in, one, and out, two, in, two, out, like that. And just make that counting very, very kind of quiet and gentle, sort of inner voice. Okay, so that it's not disturbing your concentration too much.
Okay, so now just gently begin to relax your concentration. And move your body a little bit. And slowly come back to the Zoom space. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Um, and just going to really allow some time to explore your experience with the meditation just now and also with how it's been during the week and any questions that have come up or any observations just to really share share our experience together anybody got a question or a comment to start it off Yeah, I'm happy to happy to say, David. I I think um, the counting for me helps. Right. Yeah. I I find that really really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I, I I think I was taught to count up to ten um, initially, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. that always seems a bit too many. I think seven for whatever reason. Never never heard of that until you okay. mentioned it last week. Seven works really well. Okay. Yeah. It works I, I yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why I experimented with five once, <laughs> but seven, <laughs> sevens just somehow, three sevens, I, I really like that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah I don't know. I mean, I, I, many, many years ago, I kind of settled into that somehow. It wasn't an instruction that I had, but oh, it, okay. it always seemed to work well for me. One reason I like that um, uh, kind of structure is because, and this is something I am, you know, I mean, I, I talked last week about, uh, I'll say a little bit more about my experience of learning meditation, you know, was first of all, for quite a few years, um, I found it I really struggled with this concentration meditation. You know, not so bad with the analytical meditations in the Tibetan tradition, but um, this following the breath. Um, and it was when I went on a Theravada retreat that it started to, to, to kind of improve. Um, one of the big insights for me was, you know, um, I had always thought the what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to um, keep your concentration on the breath all the time. And I, but I can't do it. You know, so I can't, I, I'm not, not able to meditate, you know. Um, but it, it was, it was this particular teacher that made it very clear the instruction isn't to keep your attention on the breath all the time. The instruction is to notice when your attention leaves the breath and bring it back again. So that I could do, you know, even though it might be like five minutes, the attention's kind of been all over the place, but then as soon as I notice it, ah, oh, right, okay, now I'll come back. So then it became to see, seem possible. <laughs> so that was a great insight. <laughs> and then over the years also, uh, the, the importance of relaxation, you know, that's come home to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to um, say more about this, uh, that in a moment, but um, so I don't want to kind of um, break into this vision. But this thing about the counting, um, what I was going to say a few years ago in one of Geshe Tashi's retreats, um, I found his, his meditation instruction incredibly helpful, actually. Um, and I actually said at the end, <laughs> at the end of the retreat, this was I don't know, about six years ago, something like that. Um, and, and he was asking for feedback from the group. And uh, the feedback that I gave was, well, I learned to meditate you know, after 30 years. <laughs> and, and there were a number of things that Geshe Tashi said it was helpful. One thing that was really helpful, I, th I said, I thought was that um, your meditation session should be about two minutes. Right. And then you then you rest. Now you're not getting up from your cushion, but you're you, you you're not you're not striving to maintain your concentration continuously for twenty minutes, which probably I didn't you know I didn't make that clear in the instruction just now. You know I didn't I didn't say that, um, but I will 
from now on. I, you know, that, that, um, um, that's something I'm going to strongly advise. So I found it three times seven is just about the right amount. You know, it's about three minutes, something like that. Um, and um, at that time point, my mind needs to rest. You know, uh, th th that's a lot of concentration for three minutes continuously. Not saying that my attention doesn't wander, it does, you know, to varying amounts. But there's, you know, for that three minute period, I'm kind of working at keeping the concentration as continuous as I can. And then, you know, take about a minute rest. So you know, kind of, you know, look up a bit, move your head, take a few breaths. You, know, you, you may even just be continuing to sit and breathing in and out, but you're not making that kind of mental effort to sustain your concentration, allowing your mind to just relax and rest. Um, so that's another reason I like that, that particular counting method. Hmm. Anyone else? Any? What did you notice? <laughs> are you reaching for your mute button there, Adele, or are you just uh, <laughs> stretching around? <laughs> I forgot I was muted there. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I was, uh, yeah, my mind was. Um, I was having a hard time sticking with the breath. Yeah. For one, my son downstairs is making an awful lot of noise. Okay. <laughs> but okay. uh, that's yeah. another thing that was straight away. Um, I get quiet. Um, oh, you know, it should be quieter. Yes, and yes. then I was thinking, well, it, it isn't quieter. Just be with what it what it is and the breath kind of thing. Right. Um, but right. yeah, I like that what you said about um bringing in relaxation right from the beginning, which is not something that um, mm -hmm. I would necessarily normally do. And that's why members, I gave myself uh, such a hard time a lot of the time and then it becomes this mm -hmm. um, rather than just, you know, just being able to relax yeah. and enjoy it maybe is a bit more. <laughs> no, I mean, it's really hard to overstate the importance of relaxation. It's absolutely crucial. You will not be able to succeed in meditation unless you're able to learn to relax the body. Um, and, you know, um, it's through relaxing the body that we're able to relax the mind. And if we don't have a relaxed mind, if there's tension in the mind, we cannot concentrate properly in meditation. So it's really vital, you know. And I want to say, I've just actually this afternoon finished a week long retreat um it is at home on zoom <laughs> which is interesting um and it was on you know some of the really ad more more advanced practices from the tibetan tradition from the tantra completion stage adam will know what i'm talking about C completion stage high yoga tantra and about 90 percent of the instruction was about relaxation right and this is from someone who's a very very experienced meditator indeed so really, you know, right up to that level, the relaxation is, is absolutely, you know, fundamentally important. So can't emphasize that enough. And if all you do in your meditation is that relaxation and you're not able to get around to doing the focusing on the breathing, well, I, in, in my opinion, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, and just a, a word about yeah the distractions. And um, that's another reason why I like this method of meditation because um, the advice, if, you, if there's something that is really bothering you that you can't kind of tune out of, which might be an external noise, or it might be internal noise, you know, be something that you, know, you kind of can't get this thought out of my head, can't get back to the breath, you know. So the, the advice, the instruction is then, you know, if something, a distraction comes and you say, okay, and you notice you've been distracted and you come back to the breath, that's fine. But if it won't go away, that becomes the object of meditation. That becomes what you're meditating. You just look at it, right? So it might be the feeling of irritation <laughs> that your son's making a noise, or it might be the noise itself. Okay, we'll just look at that noise. Because this method of meditation is to, is to observe, um, you know, clearly and mindfully whatever is, t is happening at that moment. So you're still, you're not kind of moved away from the, the meditation. You can change your object, 
but you're still doing the same meditation which is just mindfulness of what's happening in the present moment so that's a really i find that very helpful because that i find that sorry no go ahead yeah Yeah. i was just gonna say uh yeah i mean that's what i the way i would normally meditate i don't usually uh watch the breath and i'd I find that interesting trying to do that and maybe that's what I need to do to get some more concentration but I'm being practicing more just at, with mindfulness so usually yeah I have a little I don't know if it's a mantra but I just say all the time just this just this with okay. whatever's yeah. happening so normally if the noise comes up or the dog moves or whatever's happening <laughs> um but then I've been questioning myself is this enough is it more because I don't necessarily know how distracted I am you know, yeah. <laughs> until yeah. I'm going really right. with the breath and finding that really quite difficult with uh, all these thoughts. Right. And I think, I wonder how distracted I am when I think I'm being mindful, you know, if I'm just sitting with yeah. this, with mm-hmm. this. So yeah, maybe it's be interesting for me to try and stick with the, with the breath a little bit, just to see, you know, yeah. Yeah. the difference. Yeah, because the the basic method is exactly what you say, you know, um, and we'll go into a quite a lot of detail about this. And right? it's exact, exactly what you said, you know, just to be present with what is and to, to notice, be aware of what is, is the essential sort of teaching of the. Um, so this 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 is mindfulness, what we're doing. OK, but it is um, not the kind of modernized version. It's the original teaching of the Buddha himself is what we're studying of mindfulness. Um, But in the meditation practice, um, then yes, you are doing that, but also you are choosing, you know, to direct your attention to the breathing. That's the, there's other aspects to the meditation as well, but that's the main one. So yes, we are working on concentration. And Adam asked, you know, last week about, you know, how does shamatha fit into this? So up to a point, it is shamatha, is concentration um, but uh, the emphasis within that is on the mindful awareness moment to moment um, and then if as I say um, that formal meditation of watching the breath my, uh, mindfully um, is part of an overall practice of mindfulness so that when you're off the cushion you are still practicing that moment by moment awareness. Okay. And when your mind is wandering, you know, you look at that. And when, when, for whatever reason, you're not able to follow the breathing. Um, and there are other, that you can, you can incorporate other, other forms of meditation as well. But the, the, the main kind of method is that on the cushion, we're looking at the breath but our emph- the emphasis is less on the concentration than on the mindful awareness moment to moment. Okay. Yeah. So like you said, it gives you more of a kind of yardstick of, you know, how is my focus, you know, um, because if, if all you're doing is just kind of, uh, I think it's difficult to measure how clearly you are aware of what's happening if, if that's your only practice you can say well you know um oh. it's quite subtle it's quite subtle but i, I do think um the i've never come across better instructions than in this book of how to kind of get beyond the mind just going all over the place <laughs> um so although the mind does go all over the place we can watch it doing that but if we're watching it in the correct mindful way then that distraction gets less and less and we have more control of where the mind is going can i just ask david um you know you said it's shamatha to a point because we're watching um what's coming up in the mind is that i'm just likening it to something because of that because because we're focusing on a single object namely the breath that's what makes it shamatha okay the not the, the contents of the mind no um, um, if we just 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 observing what's going on in the mind um there's it's usually you know that there, this method is usually labeled as vipassana that's the usual yeah. term that's used but in this book he uses the term satipatthana 
Um, and the first part of that sati is the word that's translated mindfulness. So mm. just being aware of what's going on moment to moment, mm. that is an aspect of mindfulness. Actually, it's more, it's not a whole of mindfulness, but it's one aspect of, of mindfulness. Mm. I think I was confusing it with um, when we were doing the Shamatha course with Ben Mary recently, okay. and we did breath, then we did mind and its contents. And that was watching what came up from moment to moment. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking here. We're talking about breath, mm. but noticing what comes up from moment to moment. Is that noticing right? Noticing what goes up from moment. I mean, you know, there's a slight twist to it, Lindsay. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I just don't want to confuse myself because I do that easily. In, no, no, it's not you. It's it, it, it's it's the it's it's the material. Um, yeah. In the Tibetan tradition, there was a slightly different aspect to it. So. Yes, you start with watching the breath and then you go to watching the mind and what's arising in the mind. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the object of meditation becomes the actual nature of the mind. Yeah, and awareness of awareness, you mean. Practice. Yeah. That is a shamatha practice and that is Mahamudra. And that's what we're going to do. The third term is going to be entirely on that. I see. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's closely related to here as well. You know, this is a very close relationship between that Mahamudra method and the method mm -hmm. in, in this book. One reason why I, I wanted to kind of link the two. Thank you. Um, yeah. OK, so <laughs> I hope that's clear, but it will it will it will we'll come back to this probably yes, again, again, like the, the, the subtle difference between the Pasana insight and uh, mindfulness or Sati and um, shamatha or concentration yeah those three things are all quite closely related um, and hopefully by the end of this term you'll have a clear understanding of the difference between them they're very very you know the differences are quite subtle sometimes between those three things those three kind of mental factors if you like um, and having a good understanding of exactly what the difference is i think is very helpful for meditation Anybody else? What did you, what occurred? <laughs> what did you find, Adam? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so carrying on this thread then, they lead into each other, they bleed into each other. They do. The okay. Absolutely. So there's very difficult, <laughs> well, it's not like cut, cut and dry, especially with the no. uh, awareness style, open open awareness style shamatha yeah. is, is, is known for giving, giving rise to uh, Vipassana as, as a sort of side effect, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Not like it's not explicitly yeah. necessarily Vipassana practice because it's shamatha on either the nature of the conventional nature of the mind or whatever terminology you want to use. But yeah. the, well, the, it, it, it is both really. I mean, the yeah, is, both. Is, um, is definitely a, a, you know, a Vipassana practice as well as a shamatha practice. Mm. Yeah, because um, you, in order to meditate single pointedly on the nature of the mind, you have to identify the nature of the mind. And yes. That's Vipassana, isn't it? So, you know, you've got to be, um, um, and actually, I mean, do you know, you must know the, the, the um, uh, ninth Karmapas Mahamudra text. Text. Ninth, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, called the Mahamudra Eliminating the Darkness of Ignorance. Yeah, and then Kench and Trangu Rinpoche has done commentary on it, yes, also. Uh, Moving to Mahamudra. No, it wasn't him. It was another. It was another Kenzo. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, and uh, he presents it explicitly. You know, there's this. The, the, there's a a, 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 a a shamatha stage and a vipassana stage. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mahamudra. So yeah, it's a combination of both. Um, I'm sorry. There's a lot of technical terms here, Adele. But basically, what we're saying is, you know, there's this Tibetan system of meditation which we're going to do in the third term of this one-year course, um, and actually, it's very closely related to this one. So we'll, yeah, we might be referring back to that from time to time. But I wouldn't worry too much about it because it'll all be explained. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, just coming back to your question, Adam. Maybe you can can you can you pinpoint the question a bit more? What, what that was wasn't it? really a question. Right? Oh, it, was, <laughs> it was kind of a point of discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh yeah, another point which I thought would be interesting to yeah. bring up um, is the 
the point of the the role of the jhanas and how this is very much uh, in the original presentation of the Buddha. Then this is in my understanding of it is very much part of right concentration. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at if you read his life story, it occurs very many times the high levels of concentration, and then with that ability to concentrate, then leading to you know using that aspect of the mind to give rise to insight due to this really stable level of concentration. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I've not got your book, so I don't know if this is covered in the book. Right, well, it's a good <laughs> question. Um, so um, for those of you who may not know, the, the, the jhanas, they, they, they are um, exactly as Adam said, you know, they're, they're in, in, the, um, in the Pali um, sutras, the, the uh, Theravada um, scriptures, um, they're spoken about a lot. Um, and um, it begins with this... Um, achievement of shamatha so shamatha is both a training if you like you know practice of of, of developing concentration but it's also um, that term also refers to a particular stage of that development of concentration where the mind is able to remain uh, focused on the object of meditation continuously without any distraction for a long period of time okay so that's kind of real benchmark of got it okay you've got concentration but then there are states of concentration even deeper than that even you know more subtle rarefied states of of of, of pure concentration and the buddha spoke about um eight levels of increasingly more refined states of concentration and just in response to what you're saying um, um it's mentioned in the book um and it's interesting because what he says is that uh, because it's quite parallel to what happens in the in the Tibetan tradition, um, that initially, you know, the practice is the same whether you're seeking to to attain those high states of concentration, the jhanas, or whether you're primarily seeking to attain the insight, the understanding, you know, the the, the direct understanding of the nature of of what the mind, if you like. But at a certain point. The road forks and if you if you want if you are mainly interested in the vipassana you would not at that point go through the developing the the jhanas that the, the stages of concentration and if you're if you're if that's your aim is to develop those um concentration states then you would be to some extent putting aside the emphasis on the vipassana on the uh, on the uh, vipassana is insight okay so the vipassana practice is um seeking to get not just an intellectual un theoretical understanding if you like of um the contents of the mind what they are and how they function and their nature but a direct experience of that okay so um often you know i think the term is possibly slightly misused it, it, just kind of noticing um you know just this just this i'm not sure that that i mean that would qualify as sati mindfulness but I, i'm not i'm not sure that that qualifies as vipassana vipassana has to do with um where as well as being aware in general terms this is you know this is happening like this is a thought this is a feeling this is a you know um visual perception or a mental image or whatever is going on in the mind physical sensation as well as being aware that that it's there but also having um, an awareness of its nature that it's impermanent you know that it's in the nature of suffering that it is has is is empty by nature um, and this practice of satipatthana foundations of mindfulness is clearly understood to be a vipassana practice right so we're not just the practice just doesn't just consist of noticing what's going on but it's also being aware of the nature of that phenomenon that's happening um, but when you want to develop very very subtle fine concentration if you're doing too much of that kind of analysis of the nature of the object it will disturb the concentration so 
um, these, you know, you can these get this forking path, but then they come together later. Basically, you know, that, that um, either way you go, you'll end up with both. <laughs> so the, 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 the ultimate aim is a union of um, uh, shamatha and vipassana, a union of concentration and insight. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, just looking how we're doing for time. Well, not too badly. Okay, we've got quite a bit more time. Um, yeah, I wanted to say a word about walking meditation as well. Um, yeah, because um, I mean, I hope that. <laughs> We talk about mindfulness. I, I, I forgot to start the recording at the very beginning of the meditation. So <laughs> we're starting, actually we're starting exa exactly at the point where Adam came into the room because it, it woke me up <laughs> and I started the recording. But, so I'm sorry about that. We missed the very beginning, but I don't think that'll matter. I think you'll still be able to use it, you know, to, uh, uh, for your practice if you want to use the recording. Or you can continue to use one from last week. It wasn't too different, I don't think. Um, because a meditation in this in this particular you know this term um, it's just one form of meditation that we're going to be doing and I will record it each week you might find you know sometimes you, you prefer the way that it's being led but it's the same thing however that's only part of the practice so the, 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 the other part of the practice is what you do when you're not on the cushion um, and one of the things I want to recommend is walking meditation you might want to do that instead. You don't have to do the sitting meditation. You could do it as walking meditation instead. And um, there may be lots of ways to do walking meditation, but I think the two of the most common ways, probably the most common way, is where you're not um, focusing on the breath, but you're focusing on the feet, you know, the movement of the feet as you walk. Um, and you can do that. Um, when Geshe Tashi was leading those, he did a number of uh, uh, retreats. Uh, every year we had a week retreat with Geshe Tashi, who was our main teacher at Jamming for 24 years. Um, and for about 11 years, I think, he, he, he gave these retreats. And for a long time, they were, um, you know, um, they were half on shamatha and then half on, basically, on compassion, the other half. So we were doing meditation on the breath on the cushion, but we're also doing meditation on the breath as a walking meditation. I found that very good. I was actually able to get better concentration. I had never done it that way before. I'd done it, the, you know, the way where you, 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 you're, you're, the object of your, you know, uh, attention is, is, is how your feet are moving. So you get that kind of like, you know, the heel goes onto the ground and the flat of the foot and then the heel comes up and then the next foot comes down, you know, it's like, like that very close attention to the walking movement so that's fine if you want to do that um, but I did find doing walking meditation uh, using the breath as the object was very you know conducive it, it, it worked very well for me and I think quite a few people found that so I'm, I'm, I'm recommending that because I think it a it is it's good to be outside some of the time you might not be able to do that i mean it depends on your situation i guess whether you can you know find somewhere where you can do a walking meditation outside i'm fortunate i've got a garden that's big enough to do it um if it, it is good if you can do it outside because you know um, if you're in a room it's a little bit of a short distance unless it's quite a big room you want to have probably at least about you know 10 12 yards to walk ideally or a bit more maybe 20 yards would be would be ideal um, and just walking very slowly you know one foot in front of the other um, and exactly the same method of meditation on the breath no difference but i find it is it, you know it's quite conducive so i'm suggesting first of all between 10 and 20 minutes um, a day, you know, sitting meditation on the breath, or you could do that as walking meditation if you prefer. And then if you want to do like, you know, one or two short sessions of either, um, 
you know, at another point in the day. Like if you're, I'm going to say if you're at work, but most of us are not at work these days, are we? <laughs> We're either working at home, or, but if you are, great. You know, if you can find a quiet corner and just sit for two or three minutes and watch the breath, um, it can make a huge difference to a stressful work environment. But anyway, to come back to the practice, like a couple of times, two or three times during the day, just for one or two minutes, um, very, very beneficial, very helpful. And that will help you to um, keep that background awareness and mindfulness. You know, whenever you remember you're washing the dishes, oh yeah, I'll do this mindfully. I'll kind of, you know, bring mindful awareness to this and do it kind of slowly and carefully and notice what's uh, what I'm doing sort of thing. Um, and the idea is that that habit should gradually, you know, permeate every aspect of your life. And we can live that way. And I tell you, you know, I'm not a naturally mindful person. <laughs> um, and uh, it's taken me many years to really begin to um, develop that, that quality of general mindfulness. Um, it's really happening. I mean, I have to, I'm quite embarrassed to say it's really only happening in a serious way for me now <laughs> after about 40 years. But it does, you know, it just, it, 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 it improves the quality of your life. It really does. Um, so that's the idea is that through doing the, you know, the formal meditation once a day and um, ideally like coming back to it a couple of times for a couple of minutes um, reminds you and keeps that. The word sati, by the way, in the Sanskrit is smriti, and, and what it actually originally meant is memory, remembering. Okay. And in the Tibetan tradition, it's used differently from how it is in the Theravada tradition. Um, and it does mean remembering, it means be, 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 they talk about being mindful of your vows. You know, that's one of the main ways it's used. It's also used in technical way in meditation as well but you know um if you take in vows and if your mind is completely all over the place you know you, you, you can completely lose touch with the fact that you ever took those vows and then you break your vow and then you think oh my god you know um but somehow if you develop a certain quality where that background awareness never leaves you yeah. So that, I mean, like if you've taken the fifth precept not to drink alcohol, and somebody offers you a drink, you you know you're you know, <laughs> before you start drinking it, you think no, I've got this vow. So that that memory is in the back of your mind. So here again, you know, if there's that background awareness of just living and acting in a mindful way. Um, that's what we're trying to develop yeah. so that when there's an impulse to act in an unskillful way, perhaps to react to a situation, you know, um, in a way that might be, um, not good, um, that we can catch that on the hop, <laughs> you know, cause that mindful presence is there. Presence is another good word, isn't it? So um, that's really why we're, you know, well, one of the reasons why we're doing this kind of meditation um, is so that we can develop that quality that really kind of can save us from going astray, you know, not in some kind of puritanical moralistic sense, but just in doing things that we later might regret. <laughs> okay, um, just checking. And a little bit more time. I'm going to say a couple of words about um, yeah, the book. So I, I suggested reading the introduction um, and I sent that on the email. Um, it's quite short and it's really just sort of um,
It's a really great advertisement for mindfulness. <laughs> kind of saying why he's written the book and things. Um, and introducing mindfulness, the, uh, the way that it's understood here, which as I said is, I think it's slightly different from the general understanding of mind, mindfulness that's found its way out into the public domain, if you like. Um, it's not that the that there is any real essential difference. I, I think there's just like there's more to it, perhaps than than how it's quite often taught in this kind of basic mindfulness courses. Um, but he does, you know, very clearly convey the fact that in the Buddha's original teachings, as they've come down to us through the the Pali Canon, the Theravada tradition. Um, it's really right at the heart. So that's why he's called it the heart of Buddhist meditation. And the meditation, he says, is the heart of the practice. You know, so this um, in the Tibetan tradition, in terms of meditation, you know, mindfulness is spoken about as a mental factor that is important in meditation. Okay, so there's mindfulness and there's concentration and there's um, you know, insight, and there's um, something called discriminating alertness. You know, these mental factors that we use in meditation, and so mindfulness is very important. But here, um, it, it is refers to a complete system of meditation practice. Okay, and uh, where that comes from is from the. Uh, Sutra on the foundations of mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutra, which is one of the most important sutras in the Pali Canon. So this is the method of meditation that the Buddha taught. This is the method of meditation that the Buddha taught, um, as it's explained in this book. And the sutra itself, the translation of the sutra in the book, in full, and actually you could really, if you wanted to, you could dispense with the book and just, you know, uh, just read that one sutra and base your practice on that. And in fact, he explains, you know, that where 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 this um, the, the method of of, of of system of meditation practice um, that he's he'd been taught, you know, um, and the person who taught it to him was taught by a, a, a Burmese teacher called um, the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And this, uh, he was a Burmese monk, and he has um, you know, stories told in the book that he, he had this um, really strong desire and determination to actually um, achieve the goal of the, of the, of the Buddhist path, to, you know, to Nirvana. He, he, he was determined to, you know, find, you know, actually get the, the realization that the Buddha spoke about. And at that time, which was, I think, in the probably 1940s, thereabouts, or maybe a bit earlier, um, there were not many, you know, he, he, he found it very, very difficult to find anybody who could really give him any, any help on that matter. He, he, he heard of this one monk who was practicing way out in the remote kind of uh, forest area of, 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 or the mountains perhaps in Burma. Um, and he went to see this monk and, and the monk just said, well, why, why are you searching outside the master's word? Just, you know, it's all in this sutra. It's all you need to know is in this one text. Um, and so he, he followed that advice and uh, clearly did attain very high realizations and started a, 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 a big movement, a revival of serious meditation practice in Burma. It had become very formalistic and very kind of, you know, people were not really getting the, the, the results, the realizations. Um, and this teacher, you know, became very famous. And this Burmese Satipatthana method, this is, you know, um, now very, very well established throughout the whole Theravada world, simply based on this um, original sutra, Satipatthana Sutra. 
And there is also a Satipatthana Sutra Foundation in, 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 in the um, Sanskrit canon that's come down to, 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 through the Tibetan tradition. Um, it's a little bit different, but, uh, you know, it's just to emphasize how, how really central this practice is. You know, it's, uh, um, Nyanapati Kem really makes it clear this, uh, when he says it's the heart of Buddhist meditation, that's very, very, um, you know, high authority from that, from the Buddha himself. Um, so then, uh, the, the, um, and I, I had originally meant to um, scan the, the first chapter as well, and then I kind of made a bit of a mistake because I, I flipped the page and I thought, oh, this is a very long chapter, but actually I'd got onto chapter two there. So ch chapter one is a short chapter as well. And um, I'm just going to say a couple of words about that, and then we'll, um, or will I? Maybe I won't. No, I'm, going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that next week because I want to um, give you a bit of an opportunity to work together in the breakout rooms. <laughs> um, so what I would like you to do in those breakout groups is to talk to each other a bit more at length about how your practice has been this week, um, what's been working, what hasn't been working. So Adele, you know, you weren't here last week, but that doesn't really matter, you know, presumably. <laughs> I don't know if you've done any meditation practice during the week or not, <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't really matter because you can still talk about your experience of being mindful or not being, whatever, you know, is relevant. Um, and, um, So if you were here last week, it'd be good to sort of, any observations about what was helpful or wasn't helpful from, 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 the, from the teaching and from the, the kind of the homework. Um, and then come back and we'll just hear a little bit about um, what you discussed in those groups. Is that okay? I'm gonna give you about um, 10 minutes, a bit more than 10 minutes to, to do that. So I'll do that now. Okay, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> right. So um, I'm glad to see you weren't you weren't rushing to leave the breakout room. So you must have been quite engaged with the conversations. <laughs> um, and it would be really helpful to me to hear a little bit about how your practice has been going and. You know what's been difficult or easy or insights that you've had or experiences that you've had so please uh if you're willing let's uh let's hear a little bit about that and yeah <coughs> what did you find out from each other <laughs> we were having a getting to know you session yeah Yes. So. <laughs> Great. Great. We didn't speak that much, but we were talking about all uh, Adele's uh, uh, had lots of experience in different schools and things like that. So it was interesting to learn oh, about yeah. that. Yeah, we were just talking about that room. <laughs> so not so much about uh, no, but I'm actually, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really great because um, actually something that's on, on my notes here to talk about. I wanted to talk about support. Um, because support is vital um, and you know I'm hoping that I can you know I'm looking for ways how I can support you but I'm also um, very keen for you to support one another and, and and you know getting to know each other is is a really important part of that so great <laughs> yeah anything any anything anything else of interest came out of the conversation <laughs> um... Um, maybe um, Adele, is it all right if I ask David to clarify your question a bit better? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I sort of didn't answer Adele's uh, question particularly well. I don't think. Well, was, and she was asking about, you know, how you often or we often talk about the yeah. Tibetan tradition and the Theravadan tradition and sort mm -hmm. of the distinction between the two. Right. I was just trying to explain how is it sort of more of its a historical anomaly and. The transmission from India to Tibet and stuff. Mm -hmm. Am I right in thinking that the a version of most of the Pali Canon does exist within the Tibetan scriptural 
Mm. Not that I know of. I mean, no. there, 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 there are... Um, there are remnants of scripture, though, aren't there? There, aren't are, there? there are, well, there are um, what, they, the, what they would call Hinayana scriptures mm. within the Tibetan canon. Yeah, they, yeah. They come from the Sanskrit originally. Yeah. yeah. So they, but it's one leap on, though, isn't it? So you will have got Pali, Sanskrit translations, then going north? Oh. No? Okay. No, um, I mean, I don't think, I don't, well, this is probably a bit of history that isn't really known. Um, you, you know, how, how the, uh, the, the Pali and Sanskrit canon, exactly how they came into existence, but the, um, some of the Sanskrit uh, so-called Hinayana sutras are, I don't know whether they were translated from the Pali or whether they came down in parallel. I don't think anybody really knows that um but there, there, there are there are um you know there are uh a number there are a number of scriptures which exist in both in two versions you know so like there, there's a there's a for instance there's a tibetan dhammapada where it's nothing like the the, the pali dhammapada <laughs> um so they they, they 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 really seem to be i mean i'm not an expert so i, I i'm not sure that I, what i'm saying is absolutely 100 percent accurate i mean I, i'm going to talk about something more relevant to practice in a moment but but basically as far as i understand it um, there just were these two versions of uh, the, the Buddha's original teachings and the Sanskrit canon continued being added to more and more sutras um, uh, came as the Mahayana um, tradition developed. So the Mahayana tradition was kind of originally it was kind of like an offshoot. There were a number of different schools of the um, of early Buddhism and one of them particularly called the Mahasangika school seems to be that that evolved into the Mahayana um, because they had a particular sort of philosophical view and particular kind of practice um, but then the Mahayana um, tradition kind of was somehow the nature of it was much more open to new things coming into it so the Pali tradition the tradition that came down through the Pali which went to South India and then to Sri Lanka um, was very much focused on we don't want to change anything we want to preserve the Buddha's original words as far as we can now not everything in the Pali canon I'm sure was spoken by the Buddha you read some of those suits it's very clear that but, but it, they were only written down like 400 years after the Buddha's after the time of the Buddha anyway um, but that was the intention and that was their belief that, that this was you know their traditional belief was that this is the exact really was the what the buddha actually spoke whereas the mahayana tradition you know the more and more sutras came and they got quite very philosophically complex um and uh, you know kind of all sorts of interesting new ideas um and then there was this extraordinary thing that happened, which was that this Mahayana Buddha's tradition um, merged with Tantra, which was not a Buddhist um, uh, practice originally. It was, um, some, some people kind of say it was a Hindu Tantra, but there was no such thing as Hinduism in those days. There were just lots of different teachers teaching different things. Um, anyway, that's probably a bit of a side issue, but the, the, the Tibetan Buddhism, therefore, is that combination of the um, Mahayana tradition with the Tantra. So the Tantra became incorporated into the Mahayana and that was in North India and then that's what came to Tibet. Um, and I was going to say a bit about this actually tonight. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this course was precisely to bring out the relationship between the two because um, if we are if we're following this Tibetan tradition which is Mahayana one of the things that's very important is we shouldn't and people do sometimes fall into sort of having a little bit of a snobbish view of where the Mahayana which means the great vehicle you know this Theravada this is a Hinayana it's the lesser vehicle mm. um, Dalai Lama says you know don't call them that it's called the Mahayana should be called the universal vehicle and the Theravada should be called the um, individual vehicle anyway be that as it may um, oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was helpful. Um, it was helpful um, meeting up with Stuart again because we'd had our we'd had our weekly get together earlier today, and we had about forty five minutes discussing mm -hmm. our our practice. You know, with the, as as homework that you'd set 
to get together so Stuart and, and myself got in touch and, and did that over zoom this afternoon and we're going to do that each Thursday we go we've made a decision to sort of do it on the Thursday either morning or afternoon um so that right. we've had the full week and that we're getting together just prior yeah. to the sessions right. on a and, Thursday and you found that useful very much so Yes. Good. Yeah, very okay. Useful. Yeah, I thought. And it was, was nice. Good idea. Nice to check in again this evening after both having yeah. quite <laughs> full on full on afternoons in different yeah. ways as well. So again, it's like you know creating some kind of, um, you know, sense of of, of, of being a group and getting to know each mm. other better and and. It's and a good idea. Thank you. Mm. Yes, um, and it brings up a, a little question. So Adele, the last week people were kind of um, partnered up with each other. Um, and in fact, I'm not quite sure what to do about it. I'm going to ask Adam because Adam, do, um, have you and Alex kind of um, got together? And what what what's the story no. there? If you <laughs> Alex didn't get in contact with me. I didn't get in contact. I'm wondering, with you know, um, uh, uh, probably um, we can meet Alex's needs in one way or another. But but as Adele's new. Would you be willing and would you, Adele, be willing to, to, for you and Adam to kind of, um, it's not compulsory, it's, it's purely voluntary if, you, if you'd <laughs> like to do it, but it's just like an additional bit of support if, if you want it. And if you, if you both feel that you've kind of made a bit of a connection, you like to support each other. So the idea is just to, you know, that, that, that um, you, you meet on, on the phone or, or on Zoom once a week to just talk to each other about how your practice is going. It's purely up to you if you want to do it or not. If you want to, I'm happy to. I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to do that, Adam, if you, if you are. Fine if by me, I'll yeah. find that useful. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, would you like to put your email in the chat either to me or to Adam? And um, if you put it, if you put it so I can see it then also, because I'm going to be sending out an email with a link to the recording of the session and so on. And, and if, I, if I get your email, then I'll share that with Adam as well okay cool okay i'll just wait for you to sh share david yeah okay all right yeah okay and i'm, I'm just going to very quickly uh, come back to your question adele because i hadn't quite finished there about the relationship between the theravada tradition and the tibetan traditions the one thing i wanted to say about it another reason why i was keen to do um uh, a course based on this text is because like I said, you know, the, 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 um, there can be this sort of feeling of um, it's possible to think that because you're following a Mahayana tradition, it's somehow better. Um, and uh, it's actually, it's in the Bodhisattva vows that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't think like that. You shouldn't think that the, um, you know, the non-Mahayana tradition is, is somehow less. Um, and I thought, thought this, this book would really helped us to, to, to clarify the relationship between the two and why it's so important, you know, to this, this form of practice and, and this tradition is something that we really should um, have great respect for. But it also will come out through the course of this term and especially in the second and third term, you know, um, what is the relationship? Because I think it is something that people often are a little bit confused about. So I'm not going to explain it in detail now because we're nearly at time, but um, it's a great question and, and, and I will be saying more about it as we... It's interesting, David, on page 13 that you, you sent Raymond, um, he, he talks about, um, and I'll, I'll mispronounce his name obviously, but Santideva? Yeah. Who I believe, did he, did he write the uh, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life? Yes, that's right, yeah. Uh, so I, I think there it actually uh, that oh yes, what, yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah. About. yeah, 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 yeah. He's very clear about it, uh, and, and and talks about it, the relationship, and 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 why this particular aspect of the Theravada tradition is helpful in bridging the gap between that tradition and the Tibetan tradition and the Zen tradition as well. That they're sometimes seen as being as very different, but actually <clears throat> you can understand them all through the lens of this, you know, practice of mindfulness. And it helps to understand how they are just <coughs> different ways to approach the, the essence of the Buddha's message, really. It, it, it was one of the things that first attracted me to Buddhism was <coughs> it was all inclusive, you know, that yeah. um, all, all the teachings were considered relevant anyway. Take it. 
that's right yeah okay so thank you very much uh, we're just about at, on time so um if we could just um collect ourselves and our minds for a moment to reflect on the fact that we've we've spent two hours together seeking to go a little bit deeper into our understanding of Buddhist practice for the purpose of developing our mind and ultimately being of benefit to others. So I think, you know, we can, we can say that there is possibly no more meaningful way to spend our time. So we can feel a sense of joy, if you like, that <clears throat> we are creating the cause to find true peace and freedom from suffering and to be able to share that with others and bring that deeply important awareness into the world that needs it so badly. So just really feeling a sense of joy and hopefully also you know, in one way or another what we've done this evening may help to support your motivation and your commitment and determination to continue on that path go deeper to actually gain the the real fruit the fulfillment that is there mental development peace understanding the qualities of compassion and so on that can make us a real benefit to the world So thank you all very much um, and I'll be sending out an email hopefully tomorrow um, with the link to the recording and any other suggestions for how you might <coughs> you know uh, can support each other and yourselves to maintain a practice during the week um, and next week I'm fairly sure I'm not actually oh certain um, the intention was that this course was going to be given um, both on Zoom and face to face. Um, and we've not been able to do that this month. Um, I'm maybe not completely up to date, but as far as I understand it, we will be starting from the beginning of October. So um, I'm, I'll, I'll need to check this, but we might be, um, you know, doing the, 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 the class live. At um, um but it will be on Zoom as well. Okay, so if you're not local, you know that's that's not a problem. Um, it'll be an experiment because we haven't done that before. <laughs> so previously, you know, we've we, I've done um, a, a recording of the teachings and, and made them available to people that couldn't physically come to the class. But now we've got equipment in place, and um, the plan is that we will we will do it sort of twin track, <laughs> Zoom and live. So I look forward to seeing you either in person or on Zoom next week. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Good night, all. Good night.
Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.